Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Father Knows Best, Moral and Political Philosophy in the Instructions. Most fathers find themselves at some point, presumably unwittingly, restaging Act 1, Scene 3 of Shakespeare's Hamlet. As you'll no doubt recall, it features the wily courtier, Polonius, giving advice to his son Laertes, who is about to embark on a voyage. As with so much of Shakespeare, the scene can be played in a variety of ways. It's not so clear whether the audience is meant to be impressed by Polonius's advice, the fruits of his years and experience, or whether we are supposed to react the way teenage boys tend to react to unsolicited advice from their own fathers with impatience and eye-rolling. Either way, Shakespeare himself was, presumably also unwittingly, reprising scenes from much older literature. There are a number of ancient Egyptian writings that characteristically featured an elder figure giving advice to a younger person, usually a father giving advice to his son, and often representing in part the preparation of the son by the father to take up the societal role the father had occupied, such as scribe, government official, or king. These texts are known as instructions or teachings, and we have in fact already mentioned the genre in the episode on philosophy in ancient Mesopotamia. One of the oldest literary texts from that part of the world is known as the Instructions of Shurupak, and we also discussed how the Instructions of Supe Ameli played with and expanded the genre by having the son respond critically to his father's advice. So, it's a kind of text common to the two oldest writing traditions, those of Mesopotamia and Egypt, although it seems fair to say that the tradition was more extensively developed over the course of Egypt's literary history than in Mesopotamia. Dating back in all likelihood before the flourishing of the genre of instructions is another form of writing, known as funerary autobiographies. These are, as the name suggests, presentations of a person's life written in the first person and inscribed within that person's tomb. An approach to funerary autobiographies that gains prominence by the time of Egypt's Sixth Dynasty is the Catalogue of Virtues. Take this bit of what is inscribed within the tomb of a man named Nefer Sashemre, who served as a government official near the beginning of the Sixth Dynasty, and so roughly sometime in the 24th century BC. I gave bread to the hungry, clothed the naked. I brought the boatless to land. I buried him who had no son. I made a boat for him who lacked one. I respected my father, I pleased my mother, I raised their children. So says he whose nickname is Sheshi. The mention of his memorable nickname is welcome, but otherwise these lines give us little feeling for good old Sheshi as an individual. Instead, they convey the moral values that he and others in his society cherished and strived to uphold. The catalogues of virtues found in funerary autobiographies were thus a vehicle for moral thought insofar as they stem from and stimulate reflection on what is fundamentally important to living a good life, these texts provide, at the very least, an important step in the development of a tradition of moral philosophy. The genre of instructions continue and form the most important part of that developing tradition. We find in the instructions, as in the funerary autobiographies, a literary form that by its very structure focuses our attention on the question of how to achieve a life well-lived. Which aspects of our conduct are most important, and how should we deal with others? At the outset of an instruction attributed to Prince Harjedef, the son of King Khufu of the Fourth Dynasty, who famously commissioned the Great Pyramid of Giza, we read, Cleanse yourself before your own eyes, lest another cleanse you. This opening exhortation emphasizes vigilance in looking for and eliminating one's own faults, and furthermore gives us a reason why such vigilance is so important by pointing out that we should be trying to avoid the misfortune of having others notice and point out our faults. The best-known instruction, and arguably the masterpiece of the genre, is the instruction of Ptahhotep, sometimes called the Maxims of Ptahhotep. Ptahhotep was a vizier or chief minister to King Jedkare Isesi during the 5th dynasty, thus living around the 25th to the 24th century BC. 
We should note at this point that Egyptologists tend to doubt that the real Hajedef and Tahotep were actually the authors of the instructions attributed to them. Especially in the case of Tahotep, if we assume that he wrote the instruction, it seems that we must also assume that the text as we have it is a later revision of his original work. It is written in the variety of the ancient Egyptian language known as Middle Egyptian, which is associated with the period of Egyptian history called the Middle Kingdom, rather than the Old Egyptian of the period known as the Old Kingdom when Tahotep lived. Thus, some see the instruction of Tahotep as most likely a product of the literary golden age of Egypt's 12th dynasty and thus date it to somewhere in the period from the 20th to the 18th century BC. The work opens with the vizier Tahotep complaining about the onset of the infirmities of old age and requesting of the king that his son be appointed as a staff of old age for him. The king agrees, endorsing the instruction of Tahotep's son in the sayings of the past. Tahotep then commences offering pieces of advice, usually numbered as 37 maxims, followed by an epilogue on the value of hearing and paying attention to instruction. For some, this framing may provide reason for skepticism that the text is going to be genuinely philosophical. Isn't philosophy about questioning the traditional wisdom of the past, carefully evaluating it, rather than dutifully transmitting it? Others might not have this worry, as lots of philosophers have presented themselves as carrying forward the legacy of what has come before them, but even if you take a hard line on this, the very first of Tahotep's maxims ought to demonstrate to you that he is in fact endorsing a self-questioning attitude of the kind you expect from philosophers. He argues, Don't be proud of your knowledge. Consult the ignorant and the wise. The limits of art are not reached. No artist's skills are perfect. Good speech is more hidden than green stone yet may be found among maids at the grindstones. This striking reflection on knowledge invites us to think critically about generally accepted social distinctions and about the nature of education. Seeking knowledge, according to this maxim, is a quest that can never be completed, as there is always more to learn. It is easy to slip into a sense of self-satisfaction once we become highly advanced learners worthy of being called wise by the standards of our society. Tahotep argues that, however, those of us who are in that sense wise ought to seek to advance further still in our education precisely by turning away from the commonly accepted sources of wisdom to those who are widely deemed ignorant, in order to learn what they can teach us. As an example, he suggests that women of the servant class, in spite of their doubly low status in society, ought to be recognized nevertheless as a fruitful source of valuable knowledge. There's a wide variety of themes in the 36 maxims that follow this one, but among the most prominent is an idea that would also find approval with Polonius, who advises his son, give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. The idea is that often the best thing to say is nothing at all. This initially comes to the forefront in maxims 2 to 4, in which Ptahotep gives advice concerning what you ought to do when you are party to a dispute that is being judged by officials. The second maxim addresses what you should do if your opponent in the dispute is of a higher social rank than you are, the third what you should do if your opponent is of equal social rank, and the fourth what you should do if the opponent is of lower social rank. In each case, Tahotep's advice is the same and would be echoed by any defense lawyer today, remember that you have the right to remain silent. According to the second maxim, silence in the face of the evil speech of your social superior will communicate a sense of humility and self-control that will help you reach success. The third maxim indicates that silence in the face of evil speech will overturn the equality of social rank between you and your adversary, proving you to be superior in the realm of virtue. Finally, the fourth maxim suggests that by keeping silent, you will allow the opponent of lower social rank to say so much that he winds up refuting himself while you will also succeed in refraining from wrongdoing, for wretched is he who injures a poor man. A number of questions arise out of this treatment of silence as an expressive form of action, both admirably virtuous in itself and effectively prudent in helping you to win disputes. Why shouldn't we fear that an eloquent opponent might skillfully sway those judging the dispute with convincing lies, thus making our silence seem as if we have no rebuttal, And isn't there a point at which silence starts to seem less like virtuous self-control and more like a stubborn refusal to defend oneself? 
While these pragmatic matters are not resolved by the text, it does go on to draw an important connection between the theme of silence as virtuous and effective and the motif of seeking knowledge that emerged in the very first maxim. Maxim 24 reads, If you are an excellent man who sits in the council of his lord, concentrate on excellence. You should be quiet. This is better than a potent herb. You should speak when you know that you understand. Only the skilled artist speaks in the council. Speaking is harder than any craft. Only the man who understands it puts it to work for him. The idea here seems to be that silence is not just a virtue because it demonstrates a capacity for self-control, but also because it helps you to focus your attention on increasing your knowledge and understanding of things. Again, the point Shakespeare put into the mouth of Polonius is a valid one. When you aren't busy voicing your own views, you can listen to the views of others. When Ptahhotep says that speaking is harder than any craft, his idea is obviously not that any random production of words is difficult, but rather that wise use of this capacity, in other words, speaking from a position of true understanding, is like your grandmother's fruitcake, harder than it looks. Silence thus provides the best possible means to speaking wisely, which is to say that we ought to be silent precisely so that when we are not silent, there will be no reason to wish we had remained that way. Perhaps as a direct result of the influence of the instruction of Tahotep, the theme of silence as a virtue can be found in other classic instructions, like the instruction of Amenemope, which is thought to have been written during the period of Egyptian history known as the New Kingdom, and more specifically, during either the 19th or 20th dynasties, which are collectively known as the Ramsid period because all the reigning pharaohs were called Ramses. The instruction of Amenemope is worth mentioning not only for the way it suggests the influence of Ptahhotep, but also for the way it appears to have been itself influential, in a particularly significant cross-cultural way. We mentioned in the episode on ancient Mesopotamian literature that some works from that tradition may have shaped the creation of the Bible's Book of Job, and it is natural to suspect that the flood story in the Epic of Gilgamesh influenced the story of Noah in Genesis. Similarly, Egyptologists and biblical scholars have long noticed similarities between the instruction of Amenemope and a section of the Book of Proverbs known as Words of the Wise. In fact, the dominant view among scholars seems to be that the author of the Hebrew text must have drawn upon the work of the scribe Amenemope. When Jews and Christians read in Proverbs 22 that you should not make friends with a hot-tempered person, do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared, it would seem that they are encountering a Hebrew version of a similar passage in the instruction of Amenemope, a passage that exemplifies the way the contrast between the silent, self-controlled individual and the heated or hot-tempered person is a major theme throughout that instruction. We have in the instructions, then, a rich and influential tradition of moral philosophy, albeit not one that has been much discussed and analyzed by professional philosophers. One exception is the instruction of Ani. Like the instruction of Amenemope, it appears to be the work of a New Kingdom scribe. Two essays published in the 1990s, one by David James in a popular anthology of African philosophy, and one by Julie Maybe in the journal African Philosophy, both argue that this instruction counts as a remarkable moment in the history of philosophy. Why so? Well, the first thing to note is that, like the Mesopotamian instructions of Supe Ameli, this Egyptian instruction features an epilogue in which the son who has listened to the foregoing instruction replies to his father. The Mesopotamian work ends after the son's response, but the instruction of Ani builds the scene into a full-blown dialogue, with Ani, the father who gave the instruction, replying to the challenge by Khonsotep, his son, followed by further speeches by Hans Hotep and Ani, and then a final brief third exchange. Hans Hotep's initial challenge to his father in the epilogue involves the idea that the rules laid out in the preceding instruction are too numerous, and that it should be understood that virtue does not come as naturally to him as it does to his father. Ani reacts with a stern rebuke, affirming the possibility of moral education with a series of analogies involving the domestication of animals, and the ability of foreigners to learn how to speak Egyptian. Whereas David James interprets the further back and forth between the two as resulting in a convergence between the father's and son's positions, 
Julie maybe sees no concession on Annie's part. This disagreement notwithstanding, James and Maybe both affirm the instruction's historical importance. James says that the fact that the instruction of Ani features profound philosophical positions, dialectical development, reasoned arguments, and irony makes it abundantly clear that Socrates was not the first moral philosopher and Plato was not the first to compose artful philosophical dialogue. Maybe argues that the transition from the body of the instruction to its epilogue marks a shift from the practical enumeration of virtues, such as we've already seen in the autobiographical tomb inscriptions, to a generalized theoretical account of morality, one which even provides an answer to the question of why we should be moral in the first place. She therefore agrees with James that long before Socrates and Plato, ancient Egyptians were discussing some of the same general moral questions that we find being addressed in the ancient Greek texts, and that they were doing so in a manner which anticipates those Greek texts. To close our discussion of this literary genre, let's turn from instructions exemplifying mainly what we would call moral philosophy to those that contribute most prominently to the development of a tradition of political philosophy. There are a number of texts in this category, including The Instruction of King Amenemet, which does not hide the fictional nature of its attribution to a 12th dynasty king. It has the king giving advice to his son from beyond the grave after having been assassinated, like the ghost speaking to Hamlet. Ancient Egyptians themselves thus attributed it not to the king himself, but to a scribe named Keti. Then there is the so-called loyalist instruction, the first part of which praises and prescribes loyalty to the king, while the second part includes reflections on how various professions and activities contribute to the success of society. Perhaps the most famous political instruction, though, is the instruction addressed to King Merikare. Merikare was a king of either the 9th or 10th dynasty, ruling during the time in between the Old Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom, known as the First Intermediate Period. The instruction is, as the title suggests, not ascribed to him, but to his father, identified as King Keti. Unfortunately, multiple kings during the 9th and 10th dynasties bore this name, so it is not completely clear who the author is supposed to be. If it is indeed the work of a king from this period, though, it dates back to the 22nd or 21st century BC, which has recently led one scholar to proclaim it the oldest political treatise. The instruction begins with advice about how to suppress rebellion, which may lead one to expect a manual on how to keep power rather than a reflection on how to create a just society. This suspicion is not well founded, however. It soon becomes clear that the instruction addressed to King Merikare is, like instructions generally, a meditation on how to uphold mat. The word mat is often translated as truth or justice and can thus be seen as the core of the value system that will later be notably upheld by Superman, minus the American way. It is a central concept concerning the preservation of order and righteousness in ancient Egyptian thought, as we will explore further in our next episode. A major theme related to upholding Mat in the instruction addressed to King Merikare is punishing justly. Merikare is encouraged to punish in such a way that even in his absence, that is, when he is not there to inspire fear, people will speak well of him. He's also advised to avoid capital punishment so as not to exact wrongful punishment, apparently a comment on how fairness requires recognizing the limits of our ability to know what has happened. Well, actually, to be more accurate, he's encouraged to avoid capital punishment except for when punishing rebels. Mary Kari's father really, really hates rebels. Two other notable points in the instruction deserve mention. Firstly, it features what is presumably the oldest recorded argument for meritocracy. Mary Kari's father says, Do not prefer the well-born to the commoner. Choose a man on account of his skills, then all crafts are done. This apparent lack of concern for entrenching social hierarchy relates to the other point we want to mention as well. Mary Kari's father offers an argument for something that might seem quite distasteful from an egalitarian point of view, namely the importance of a rich bureaucracy. Here's the argument. Advance your officials so that they act by your laws. He who has wealth at home will not be partial. He is a rich man who lacks nothing. The poor man does not speak justly, not righteous is one who says, I wish I had, he inclines to him who will pay him. 
This argument is fascinating because it justifies elevating one portion of society to a place of economic privilege on the grounds that this is the best way to achieve the egalitarian goal of the equality of all before the law. Mary Carey's father suggests that people ought to be able to expect officials who judge disputes to be impartial, and officials who lack wealth are, he claims, more liable to be swayed by bribes. The rationale is thus a paradoxical one. It is precisely the poor who are not in a position to offer a bribe who should want there to be a class of spectacularly rich government officials, since their wealth will make bribery ineffective anyway. What should we make of this argument, and especially of its claim that the poor man does not speak justly? It is interesting to wonder whether there is a critical response to this claim in one of the greatest works of moral and political philosophy in ancient Egyptian literature, one which may take some inspiration from the instructions, but which is not itself an instruction, the tale of the eloquent peasant, whose title character would be a fine example of someone who would crush you in debate if you elected to fall silent. We'll be discussing this tale in the next episode, along with The Dispute Between a Man and His Ba, a difficult but intriguing work that one scholar has described as presenting the earliest insights into the complexities of the human psychological structure. So, remember the words of Polonius. The apparel oft proclaims the man, neither a borrower nor a lender be, and do not dull thy palm with entertainment a part of course from the entertainment provided by the history of Africana philosophy. (laughs) 